Good morning, respected management of the St. Philomena's College, Mysuru, students, faculty members, and members of the scientific community. Today, I'm going to unravel the mysteries of the mind and talk about the implications of biological rhythms on the neuroscience of learning and health. Why is it so important? What are biological rhythms? What is this new science called chronobiology? And looking at how learning is affected due to certain circadian clock portions and certain aspects of health which can be modulated better by understanding your own body and its timing according to what environmental cycles can afford in every season of life. Thank you for having me today and I hope you have an enjoyable learning experience for the next hour or so. So what is chronobiology? Chronos is time and biology is the science or study of life forms. So definition of chronobiology in its simplistic forms is the science of the study of the effects of time on living organisms. So you see it's a cyclic phenomena, a cyclic phase. And there's a rotation of the earth around the axis and around the sun. And due to that you have um, seasons and you have all kinds of cycles. So, you know, chronobiology's effect of the timing mechanism that is relating to your daily life cycles. Now, it is over a period of 24 hours and there are a lot of terms in chronobiology like entrainment and zeitgebers and environmental cues. But you need to understand that the clock is located in the brain and that's what we need to see. Human chronobiology studies show that the human body has a clock in the brain which is known as the biological clock or the body clock and this clock keeps time for you timing in order for you to function optimally and effectively carrying out different functions and different timings of the day so you can see you have best coordination at 2 30 pm high alertness at 10 am of course, melatonin, which is the sleep hormone or darkness hormone is secreted at 9 p.m. Then you have deeper sleep at 2 a.m. And then you have melatonin secretion stopping in the morning at 7.30 a.m. So you have testosterone secretion, high alertness and, you know, greater cardiovascular efficiency and muscle strength in the evening time. So you can see different time of the day you have different activities which are optimally conducted and carried out. This is because the clock is keeping time for you. And excellent studies by Franz Alba, Jürgen Oshoff, Colin Pittendridge, Sergi Dan and Erwin Bunny, some of these great um, chronobiologists who laid the foundations for studies in the cycle of how the biological clock controls the human body. It's a very innovative science and um, the Nobel Prize in Chronobiology was won in uh, medicine by the Americans in 2017. And I was in the USA at that point in time at Oklahoma at Dora Roberts University. And we were actually conducting some simple studies on uh, chronobiology as well. And we had Jeffrey Hall and Michael Roshbash and Michael Young um, who conducted these research studies on molecular mechanisms controlling circadian rhythms. Prior to that, in 2014, we had the Nobel Prize in Chronobiology won by neuroscientists. And uh, this was in physiology and medicine uh, by John O'Keefe and Britt Moser and Edward I. Moser from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology in Trondheim. And you should study what they had looked for. And it was excellent how the GPS system and the coupling mechanisms of circadian cycles can actually help you to navigate through certain um, you know, areas and how to identify different places on the map. So now coming to the technical definition of circadian rhythms. Circadian rhythms basically are self-sustaining biological rhythms characterized by a free running period of about 24 hours, circa DM, about 24 hours. So what happens is these rhythms are ubiquitous. They are controlled by an endogenous intrinsic clock. And they are entrained by extrinsic mechanisms like light, temperature, photoperiod, 
relative humidity, and so many other extrinsic social cues, variables, uh, other variables. So there are characteristics of circadian rhythms which are exhibited even in bacteria, certain aspects, fungi and plants, flies, fish, mice, humans, you know, and these can be phase shifted, they are adaptive, and they occur at molecular levels. So you have period and timeless and cryptochrome, some of these genes um, which are there, and you can see that chronobiology and neurobiology almost integrated sciences because the body clock is located in the in the forebrain and uh, the SCN or suprachiasmatic nucleus, and that is controlling as uh, the brain is the master, you know, um, organ, the entire rhythmic function of all organs of the body. So you see the rhythm is a sequence of events repeating again and again. So it's basically a sequence of events that is repetitive on a daily basis. Every day we have 24 hours. So you have certain rhythms which are expressed repetitively over every single hour of the day. And you have the highs and the lows and you have the amplitude, you have the crests and the troughs and you have the heart rhythm. You can take a look at the blip and you can see how the heart rhythm functions and almost all organs of the body, you know, hormonal secretions, they are undulating and they have wavelengths. So basically a biological rhythm is also a circadian rhythm. I mean, it is a term that is used interchangeably. So it is repetitive. Example, in humans, you have the heart rate, you have breathing, hormonal secretion, you have menstrual cycles. Now menstrual cycles, of course, is a monthly cycle. So, you know, you have to understand there are circadian rhythms that are over 24 hours, but there are also ultradian rhythms, infradian rhythms, and, uh, you know, circuitidal and all kinds of different types of rhythms on different um, time frames. You also have the body temperature, which is wavering, undulating, and you also have a sleep-wake cycle rhythm. Sleep-wake cycle rhythm is one of the most important rhythms uh, to be studied and um, it has shown that if sleep-wake cycle is distorted or disturbed, then there's a desynchronization of the mechanisms leading to various kinds of disorders or ailments in human beings. So there are daily variations in physiology and behavior, which are an integral part of life. So you see, the clock ticks, regulation by time. You have nature, you have flora, you have fauna, whether it's plants, even plants have their own rhythms. The leaves close and open, even flowers bloom and blossom according to certain seasons. And the timing of the, of the clock is seen in plants, it is seen in birds, it is seen in animals, it is seen in human beings. And if it is light here, then it is night there. And if it's night there, it's light over here. So that ha that's how it happens, you know, Western and Eastern hemisphere. So, it's very intriguing to see how the level of timing effects of natural and artificial light studies of photoperiod. So the biological clock regulates every aspect of human physiology. Each and every organ is regulated. Cognitive performance or muscle strength or sleep maintenance, you have a maximum um, sort of an optimal period by which it is done during the day. So here you can see, environmental changes, internal body clock, and you have the synchronization because of the body clock or the circadian clock in the brain that keeps timing for each and every cell and organ of the body to conduct its activity efficiently at certain points in time of the day. Light is the most important ziyat giver or an external stimuli that synchronizes the clock mechanisms. So you can look at this, our body clock adjusts slowly to changes in the environment. So as the earth rotates, you can see changes. There's a movement of the cycle and there's a movement of the waveform. The history of chronobiology is very interesting to see how this science was first founded, the study of time on living organisms. What is this all about? Fourth century BC, you had Androsthenes. He described the diurnal leaf movements in the tamarind tree. And you know, you had uh, 13th century, there were uh, circadian processes in humans mentioned briefly. And then, you know, 1729, we had Jean Jacques Siotz Marianne. So he carried out some works on the Mimosa Purica, you know, touch me not plant. And he saw a lot of intriguing results. And then 
Carlos Linnaeus and then Patrick Gilbert in 1896. So uh, they studied human beings and, you know, flowers and, uh, you know, sleep deprivation in humans. Uh, what are the implications of sleep depri deprivations? What are the results of this? So these are some of the studies that um, set the foundation of a science in animals, in plants and in human beings that showed that there is a cyclic rhythmic function. Every day you wake up, every day you sleep. And then every day you have to eat, then you have to have a secrete uh, endorphins. You have to secrete, uh, you know, all kinds of hormones, for example, digestive hormones to digest your food. Then you need, um, you know, hormones to study. You know, you have hormones in the brain, known as neurotransmitters. They help you with cognition and memory and learning. So we needed to see as to when they are optimally secreted and how we can improve our understanding of human circadian rhythms. The earlier studies in human, specifically human circadian rhythms were carried out by Michael Schifre. Now, Michael Schifre was a French cave explorer. And uh, he did a very interesting study. He used himself as an experimental model. He went into a cave, oh, yes, actual cave. And he stayed there in isolation, almost like a human bunker, if you ask me. And those days, caves were very dark and dingy. And so in Texas, he went in there and two types of studies were carried out, I think 1962, 1972. Um, you know, he was a speleologist and a cave explorer. And he went in there and he lived in a subterranean cave and in this cave he had no access to sunlight no access to external clock calendar or sunlight to maintain or monitor his biological clock and then uh, he emerged after almost 100 and um, you know 79 days and he kept timing for himself his locomotor activity and he wanted to see how his body clock was free running basically the free running period how uh, he could calculate that there are terms, you know, free running period. And, and uh, this is technical jargon, I won't go there. But, uh, you know, he calculated certain uh, attributes of the biological clock of his own body. Then Nathaniel Claytman in 1938, again conducted experiments on physiology of sleep and circadian rhythms. And now uh, students are looking at uh, studying circadian rhythms of bats in caves and the mutations that occur in the eye pigments of the bats, you know, those in the lonar crater, those bats are mu almost mutated in those caves. They live there, you know, generations together. And uh, it's intriguing. Some of my colleagues worked on those studies and I worked on the drosophila and the fruit flies. And we were looking at how uh, the circadian rhythms of, uh, you know, high altitude and low latitude flies are different. We were doing comparative research studies at that point in time. Now look at the master clock, okay? This is your body clock, the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So if somebody asks you, what is chronobiology? Chronos, time. Biology, you know, science of living organisms. So the effect of time on, on living organisms. And what is the master clock? It's the pacemaker that keeps time for you. It is your body clock, it is located in the brain. So here you see, you have, uh, you know, certain snapshots of the body clock and its critical location in the brain actually integrates circadian rhythms and neurobiology. So if you look at how light enters the eye and then you have, you know, you know, pigments, eye pigments, you have, of course, rhodopsin and conopsin and due to light, there's entrainment or synchronization, almost like a fine tuning of the clock. So the light cycles every day, tune the clock. And the master clock then starts functioning and all other clocks in the lungs, heart, muscle, liver, gut, renal, reproductive system start ticking. So the whole concept of even growing old, gerontology, who's keeping time for you? The internal body clock. So time ticks from within, not just from outside. So you have extrinsic cues and you have intrinsic cues, both synchronizing to keep time for you. Now, if you look at brain and physiology, because it is located in the brain, we need to understand the neuroscience of uh, how circadian rhythms affect learning. Brain physiology is very, very uh, you know, I'd say very clear. You have 
four lobes and uh, the frontal lobe is responsible for certain functions, the occipital lobe is responsible for other functions, the parietal again, and the temporal lobe. Um, temporal lobe, particularly for speech, hearing, and memory, and uh, the brainstem, which controls your heart rate, breathing, and blood pressure. The frontal lobe, again, intellectual function, behavior, personality, muscular movement, all this takes place in human beings. And parietal lobe sensation, all kinds of sensory stimuli are registered and decoded there. The occipital vision at the back and the rear end of the brain. So basically, your eyes are like the lens of a video camera. You actually see the image of the camera developing on the magnetic strip embedded at the back of the camera. But the lens capture the light. Similarly, light rays are captured by the eyes. They are transmitted through the optic chiasma. And there is an image formation right at the back of the brain, the occipital lobe. So that's how it's so complex. And it's uh, such a mysterious functioning of neuroscience. When we look at the technical definition of neurons, these are highly specialized cells located only in the brain, which are responsible for learning. So you have a basic neuron design, which shows the cell body, the nucleus, and the filamentaceous extensions known as dendrites. These dendrites communicate closely. And by linking together, you have a synaptic connection, a synaptic formation, and then you have enmeshed neurons, so many of them. And you have these electrical stimuli or biomolecules zapping through known as neurotransmitters. So you can see it lighting up or firing when you record the activity in the brain. Glial cells, of course, are supportive cells which provide a framework and nourishment for the neurons. So when you look at the scientific basis of learning, brain cells responsible for learning are the neurons. They are located in the brain. You have dendrites without which are filamentaceous extensions and uh, you have axons and neurons and you have synapse. When two neurons communicate, you have an electrical chemical message passing through, through these biomolecules known as neurotransmitters. And when information is processed and communicated, first communicated, then processed through neurons, you have learning. And then you have memory storage also. So this is how synaptic transmission occurs these biomolecules and you have receptor sites from one neuron to another through the dendrites and it's fascinating to see how there's an electrical pulse almost that can be recorded on the computer blip and screen that's synaptic transmission so neurological basis of learning when you have these neuronal circuits almost like thick branches and bushes and trees growing in the brain so whenever you learn a procedural skill or learn some cognitive task or you know read something or you perform an activity, it's because the neurons are connected, it's because you're actually alive, because these cells com communicate with each other. Um, it's the almost like a CPU of the computer, you know, and you have different storage sites also in the brain. So that's what it is. Now, when we look at the implications of biological rhythms on the neuroscience of learning and health, there are so many diverse sort of functions of biological rhythms or circadian rhythms, which are these rhythms, these are rhythms of in the human body conducted or carried over a period of 24 hours. They're expressing themselves over 24 hours. I told you there are many rhythms. Now, do these rhythms actually affect neuroscience of learning, your learning cycles? What about your health and well-being? As adults, as children, as elderly people, most of these cycles are seen affecting education and not many people know about it because there's so much of scientific research in chronobiology and neurobiology that is not understood by the general educational community and fraternity in schools and colleges and universities. However, it is understood mostly by the scientific community, by the scientists, by the researchers. But we need to now decode this and we need to unravel the mysteries of the mind and make it more generic make it more application based so that people in uh, schools and colleges and universities actually understand the fundamental tenets of what 
our circadian rhythms and how they affect learning. So we'll talk about circadian rhythms and biocognitive cycles. That's the first uh, you know, area of study. And second, we'll see how age dependent learning windows of opportunity. Can subjects be learned best at a certain age? We need to look at that. What about neurosystemic influence on learning and career? Multiple pathways that can entrain you to be a better human being or to unlock your full potential. What are your creative facets? What is your endogenous sort of intrinsic value added uh, innate talent? So we need to look at these things. Learning and brain development. How does the brain develop? right side of the brain. There's a right half and a left half of the brain and left half. You have four lobes, but you have two halves, left and right. How do these develop? Gender differentiation in learning. Do boys dif learn differently from girls? Are male brains different from female brains? Why is there such a differentiation? Diet and cognitive cycles. Sleep. Why is it important? And different rhythms and implications of exercise. Special educational needs, there are some of these special children. And then we need to look at mirror neurons. What are mirror neurons? When have they been founded? Then the implications of circadian rhythms again in genetics, in health and wellness. That's a new frontier area and it's uh, growing leaps and bounds. And of course, we'll close with the integrated science of holistic development and wellness, so we'll quickly grow, go through these slides. So first, let's look at circadian rhythms and biocognitive cycles. So biocognitive cycles are certain, uh, you know, implications of cognition and timing of the day and age group and how cognition varies according to different ages and different stages and time of the day also. So you can look at the rhythms, pre-adolescent, adolescent rhythms over a single day. There's a slight variation. Then you have the chronotype the larks and the owls. The larks prefer to start early in the morning. So people in this category uh, or students in this category generally found to study best during early hours of the morning. They sleep early as well. And um, then you have the owls. The owls start their day late. They sleep late. They study late into the nights. So that's the owl for you. What is the differentiation? between the night owl and the early bird. They say the early bird gets the worm. Is that really true? We cannot just generalize science. Night owls are very intelligent. They are indulgent people. They are usually goal oriented. They are dreamers. They are fun loving. Whereas the early birds are perfectionists. They are planners. They wake up. They are usually smiling. They have ideas. They're full of imagination. So you have two types of people and you also have an intermediate type of uh, community that can flip between the two. And Horn and Osteberg in their very classic experiment uh, developed a morningness, eveningness questionnaire and you can download it. Published in 1976 in the International Journal of Chronobiology. And they showed how chronotypes speak and set during late teenage years. And um, you know, whether you're an owl or a lark, can be accurately measured through this questionnaire. We did some studies published in a peer reviewed journal and um, the correlation was to assess whether circadian chronotypes actually affect academic achievements. And there are some more details in this study on morningness and eveningness and how clocks are different and the whole genetic mechanism is intriguing to study in the future. This was published in the International Journal of Psychology and Neuroscience. Then if you look at memory now, as a part of the biocognitive cycle, it has been shown that the time of the day actually affects memory storage and memory formation. So there are two types of memory in learning, literal memory, inferential memory. Literal is of course facts, names, numbers, and formulas. That is why in the timetable you need to have math and English and sciences being studied in the first half of the day. And then inferential memory, which is poetry, fiction, art, music, sport, all that should be done in the latter half of the day. So this is how memory storage and formation varies by the clock. And if you look at the information processing model, you know, informa information is processed. You have the short term memory, long term memory, where you remember it could be episodic or, you know, 
any memory that is semantic and uh, short term memory and working memory. Working memory is the now, for now, like not right now I'm talking to you. So you're registering information in your brain, at least part of it, because part of it the brain cannot understand, then you forget. And short term memory is processed into long term memory. And this usually happens at night when you sleep. An excellent paper, 10 Steps to a Better Brain by Kate Douglas et al., New Scientist, published in 2006, should be studied. Now let's look at age-dependent learning windows of opportunity. Does age actually affect learning? Can subjects qualitatively and quantitatively be, can they be learned at a specific age? So if you look at um, the age, dependent learning windows of opportunity. So this was shown even by a book, Brain-Based Learning by Eric Jensen. He showed that actually age does affect learning. And he showed that learning math occurs best when your fundamental basics are taught in childhood. Languages can be learned best in early childhood. So in early childhood, what happens is the rate of learning is quick because the rate of neuronal growth is very fast. It's rapid. So the neurons are proliferating at a very rapid pace in the brain. So you have uh, vocabulary being picked up by children. So if you look at the you know, phonemes, memes, phonetics, all this is taught to children at a very early age. And by the age of 10, children can pick up two or three languages. And I'll show you a case study on that. Emotional control also and values, can they be developed in the earlier years of life? Yes, train a child the way he should go and when he's older, he will not depart from it. IQ and uh, instrumental music. So these are all taught at earlier years of life. For example, language ac acquisition, because the Broca and Wernicke's areas are the first areas of the you know, brain to develop, especially in the temporal lobe, you can see that language learning is very quick. So it's children pick up two or three languages very quickly in the early childhood, not a problem at all. They don't have to go to tuitions. And uh, dendrites are growing rapidly during the earlier years of life. Factors affecting dendritic growth and there are negative factors affecting dendritic growth. So in an enriched environment, Learning is very meaningful, it is fun and enjoyable. And even in adults, you have neurogenesis and I'll talk to you about that a little later. So this is a case study of how age affects learning subjects. And language is the first subject actually to be learned by children. That's what neuroscience is showing. Developing a value in children. The marshmallow experiment, a very classic experiment conducted by Walter Mischel and Stanford, you know, they actually worked with children and they showed how children who waited uh, for an extra marshmallow over a period of 10 or 15 minutes actually did better in life when they were tracked for 17 years. They showed that those children who have the ability to wait, they can get, you know, double benefits and um, they had better SAT scores and they had better educational attainment, uh, body mass index and um, that is equivalent to resilience. So delayed gratification is good rather than instant gratification where you want everything right now. It's good to wait sometimes. And uh, this patience or self-control is a value, it's qualitative. And when developed in children at an earlier age, shows a lot of impetus and value in the latter years of life, in your adult years of life. That is why children need to be educated and taught by parents and by their teachers and by their family members, uh, the concept of self-control. Now, the biological time changes with age. You know, as you grow older, there's a phase shift and, you know, you have reaction, cognitive time and sleep maintenance uh, at a different rate. And a lot of studies have been carried out in university students also, and the effects of gadgets on university students, mobile phones, and sleep deprivation. And is there a difference between the owls and the larks in subject preferences, in careers, can they do better in different careers? What about hormonal cycles when um, you know children reach teenage years and from teenage, the cusp of teenage years to adulthood? So the clock timing changes. 
And so the reaction time changes and uh, the modulation changes a little bit. Um, you need to see that, you need to study that, even the sleep cycle. Now, if you look at the third aspect, you look at the neurosystemic influence on learning and career. So the brain is receiving external stimuli, right? You have five sensory organs, the eyes, the ears, the nose, and the, the tongue, and you know, touch. So what happens is when it gets this extrinsic stimuli from external sources through your sensory organs, it was seen that learning is best suited for visual learning. That means through the eyes, 46%, a general study was carried out. Auditory learning is only 20%. Kinesthetic or touch and feel, 35%. So you need multimodal approaches of st sensory stimuli to the brain for it to affect conducive learning for the student. So you can see all this. Eyes, ears, taste, smell, touch, and then the crisscross sectioning of the brain, tapping of neurons, and the left half of the brain controlling the right half of the body and the right half of the brain controlling the left half of the body and it's functioning. It's intriguing. It's just, it's just beautiful, you know. Then if you look at gadgets, if you look at the neurosystemic influence of gadgets on learning, for example, media, any kind of media, it could be digital media, it could be print media. Now, what happens is when you use a lot of digital media like iPhones or iPads or you have laptops, um, what happens is you're skimming and skipping through information. So what happens is you develop something known as concept thinking. You become conceptually aware because you're surfing through information. You're surfing through the internet quickly, rapidly. It promotes conceptual thinking. But when you read print media, like a book, for example, it facilitates deep reading and it facilitates critical thinking. That is why it's important to have both print media and digital media utilized in schools and colleges. Multiple intelligence, so many pathways and biochemical pathways that can tune your senses and sensory preferences, your your limbs, your agility, your talents, and all these pathways are shown scientifically to promote certain preferences to learning through the learning styles and different intelligences, um, which help you with choosing your life's vocation and your life's calling and your interests and your hobbies. And these actually shape your life and shape your career. And thereby you can then shape society. It'll transform you, then you transform society. This is multiple intelligence. Now, what about learning and the brain? What about subjects? Why do we really learn all these subjects? Do we have to learn subjects in combination? And do we really have to go to school? Why do we study subjects? Because subjects or these uh, lessons or in cognition in different domain areas actually shape the brain and learning. So the left half of the brain is shaped by math, science, languages, computer sciences, and general knowledge. That's how it functions. That's how it becomes more optimal. The right half of the brain develops because of artistic fields like art, craft, music, sports, theater, and drama. Kathleen Sircone in 2006, again, brought up brain-based learning in a brilliant effort to summarize the neuroscience of learning and its effect in pedagogy and education. So if you look at left-right brain conflict, the left half of the brain in this pictograph shows that the left half of the brain can read the word. And you can quickly read it, yellow, blue, orange, black, red, green. Whereas the right half of the brain is actually reading the color. So now you read the color, green, red, blue, yellow, blue, black. So this is how it is. So we have to make it simplistic to understand that how left and right half of the brains are functioning in unison, but they have different functions. That's why subjects have to be learned in school in the right combinations to develop both left and right half of the brain. Now, if you look at a 3D image of this girl or lady rotating, different people will see differently. Some will see her rotating clockwise, some will see her rotating anti-clockwise. And this is the whole dichotomy, dichotomy of building perspective. 
perspective is built in your brain through your eyesight, through not knowing, through philosophy. But if you look at the scientific basic of what this is all about, if you can see the girl rotating clockwise or anti-clockwise, here are your attributes and qualities. Anti-clockwise, these kind of people who can see the girl or the image rotating anti-clockwise, they're the ones who use logic. They're detail-oriented, facts rule, words and language are a preference. They can analyze the present and past very well. They're into math and science. They can comprehend. They're knowing, acknowledging, and they're order and pattern-based. They actually know object names. They're reality-based, pragmatic, practical, and they play safe. Whereas the right brain users who can see the image rotating clockwise, they use feelings. They're imaginative, big picture oriented. They have symbols and images that uh, actually give them a better you know, perspective towards life. And they analyze the present and the future. They plan for the future. They are into philosophy and religion. They can get it and appreciate meaning and spatial perspective and spatial perception. They are those that have some kind of a faith system they are fantasy based, they are impetuous sometimes, they present possibilities and they are risk takers. So left brain users, right brain users. Left brain users are developing because they learn those subjects that develop the left brain. Remember math, languages, and then you have computer sciences and general sciences. And then right brain users are developing these personality traits again because these traits are developed as an output mechanism because the input has been given earlier. Art, music, theater, drama. So input equals output. You want to be sharper and smarter to develop these qualitative traits, then you need to learn the right kind of subjects. So brain development actually influences your personality. Now the fifth important aspect is gender differentiation in the brain, in the brain between boys and girls. Are boys and girls or men and women hardwired differently genetically and through neuroscience? What is neuroscience showing? These are some of the you know, generic trends that are seen in boys and girls in schools. And uh, Lisa Elliott in Scientific American published uh, some of these findings. You know, differences in learning abilities between boys and girls, differences in uh, you know, assessment, can be modulated sometimes, sometimes. And you can see anatomical differences, isn't it? Women have uh, better abilities to multitask. Is multitasking a myth? Are males really better at math? It's a very contentious study that was carried out at Harvard University. But um, it, I mean, it's meaningful, you know? All studies give you a glimpse into something different, create a little bit of a cognitive dissonance, and then you have to review and relook at those areas with interest and positively so that you can study what is it that you can do or what value can you add to that study now if you look at gender differentiation and brains it's uh, intriguing to see um, the male brain is networked with neuronal connections from the back to the front whereas the female brain has neurons networked in a crisscross zigzag fashion in between the two halves between the lobes so men is crisscross from back to front. You know, you have interconnected network this way and the females have it this way. So it's exciting to see how, uh, you know, girls can be better verbal communicators. Boys, they are better at spatial abilities. Um, boys are nonverbal communicators. Girls are more sensitive to sensory data. Boys are better at gross motor skills. And the females express emotions through words very well and boys express or males express it through actions. That is why there is a difference in how we behave, how we think, how we look at life. Women, they say, are very cooperative and non-confrontational. And um, hopefully that is true in men as well. And uh, men, as much as they are competitive, are very cooperative and collaborative. And uh, females use both left and right hemispheres of the brain because of this crisscrossing network of neurons and the blood vesicles and the thicker corpus callosum that is seen in the female brain. The male brain also does have it, but it's a little different. So they mainly use the right side of the brain. I, I would define, I would say maybe left half of the brain. But kinesthetic ability, strength, physical strength is more in uh, males. 
So this is how it works, you know, and you have to be looking at uh, um, significant differences between men and women in learning styles uh, because of the scientific pathways, and the genetic pathways and the neural connections and the structure and functioning of the brains, different brains between men and women. Now look at diet and cognitive cycles. This is even more, uh, I would say simplistic because you need to see how the brain functions as the master organ of the central nervous system. The brain only makes up 2.5% of the body or 5% maximum, but uses 30% of the body's energy. It's like an energy guzzling organ and it utilizes almost 700 calories for normal functioning every day. These neurotransmitters, I talked to you about the neurons and the neurotransmitters. These are the biomolecules or chemicals that are responsible for cognition. And they are usually and often the byproduct of digestion. So you need to eat the right kind of foods in order to give you the right kind of uh, levels and optimum levels of, uh, you know, these hormones. And, uh, and especially required in adult, adult years, pre-adolescent years, and few of these neurotransmitters include dopamine, serotonin, acetylcholine, GABA, glutamine, you have histamines, and all, all these kinds of neurotransmitters. These are chemicals, and these are neurotransmitters responsible for learning and cognition in the brain. So look at, uh, you know, the neurotransmitters and uh, what is the best kind of food or diet you can have for optimum secretion of this neurotransmitter. And this neurotransmitter has specific functions. Serotonin is responsible for mood, memory, processing, sleep, cognition. What are the kind of foods you can have for that? Dopamine is responsible for pleasure, reward, motor functions, compulsion, and preservation. Acetylcholine, short-term and long-term memory, formation and storage. Tyrosine, very important for sleep. Of course, melatonin is responsible for sleep, but you have the amino acids, uh, you know, tyrosine and, uh, you know, antioxidants are also important. They combat aging. They mop up the free radicals floating around. Then you have docosahexanoic acid, omega-3 fatty acids. These are responsible for alertness, focus, and retention of whatever information that you're processing in your brain. These are again due to certain foodstuffs. So you can get all this information on 10 steps to a better brain, Kate Douglas et al. in New Scientist 2006 paper. Uh, article is good. Um, you need to look at uh, diet control. And as students and adults, you need to try and uh, modulate your diet in order to the main, uh, keep your brain fit and fine and it's all about mind-body interactions and a sound mind and a sound body, both are equally important. Then looking at the seventh virtue of sleep, different rhythms in the human being or in humans and exercise. So in sleep, we have, you know, certain wavelengths or certain waves. For example, these are the delta waves. These are generally strongest when a person is in deep dreamless sleep. And this is what a brain wave actually looks like. The bottom over there, you can see the brain pulsating. There's a brain wave out there. So either it pulsates fast, alpha brain wave, and then you have a theta, which is a relaxed meditative state of frame of mind. And delta is a deep dreamless sleep state. So you need to be in a certain state of mind to study. So external variables and stimuli put you into a state of mind. What about music? Does music modulate brain waves in the brain? Of course. And so you need to see which state you are in. And then if you're a state in a state of mind to study, then fine. And sleep is so important in order to rest and relax. And what are the functions of sleep? Melatonin is the darkness hormone of the sleep hormone secreted by the pineal gland. Sleep has certain important functions which are restorative, adaptive in the human body, and they are also cognitive. So um, the role of sleep is profound. And you have slow wave and rapid eye movement sleep. You can study that later. And what are the different functions of these uh, sleep forms in human beings? And uh, look at human circadian rhythms. And they are all keeping in time with the body clock. And the body clock is controlling this. And it's functions for homeostasis or normal you know, melatonin secretion, what about growth hormone? All that is being secreted when you sleep. Lymphocyte formation, eosinophil formation, cortisol, testosterone, and you know all these um, aldosterone, blood pressure, heart rate. All this is in the blood. Platelets, viscosity of the blood also. All this is optimally regulated 
by uh, the human circadian time structure, if you study in detail. And then during the day hours, uh, cholesterol and triglyceride, uh, you know, sort of uh, levels in the blood and uh, body temperature, respiratory rate, insulin secretion, blood flow, gastric secretion, excellent, you see. And um, this is how it works. What about exercise in the brain? What about exercise? Does it really help? Of course, when you exercise, this promotes cognition, promotes learning, because it produces neurochemicals that promote brain cell repair. It improves memory, lengthens your attention span, and helps you with better decision making, better motor coordination, and multitasking, planning. And new nerve cells and blood vessels are actually you know, developed. So exercise basically helps you in secreting a hormone known as endorphin. Endorphins are the happiness hormones. That is why you need to be happy. And one of the ways to be happy is to have a creative hobby that helps you to, you know, de-stress. And what is stress? Nothing but a biomolecule, cortisol, which builds up in your blood. So in order to combat the effect of cortisol, you need endorphin. So in order to release and secrete endorphins, you need to exercise vigorously. Play a sport, go to the gym or a jog, play a group sport, you know, football. You can have tennis, you can do swimming, you can go jogging and do a little bit of martial arts, any little thing, even walking is very good. So now coming to the eighth area, special educational needs and mirror neurons, what is special education? So you have all these range of um, disorders and learning disabilities and you can, you know, there are such a range and a spectrum of these learning disorders. And nowadays in many schools, especially the international schools, there is an inclusive learning space where children with uh, learning disorders and disabilities also integrated into the mainstream and they have a, a special educational needs counselor, a special educational needs department and room and we have to be empathetic towards the needs of some of these children and adults even in the colleges and the universities. So if you look at diagnosing the brain disorders, first a scientific report is required to validate whether he or she has got this learning uh, disorder through brain imaging uh, techniques. You can have uh, you know, these techniques to show whether you have a genetic issue or, you know, is it a mutation? Um, what is the brain damage and what kinds of an abnormal growth do you see? I mean, uh, and these can be shown through functional magnetic resonance imaging and positron emission tomography and the CAT scan also. So, um, so we need to find out what exactly is going on in the minds of our children. Are they normal? Some of them have issues like ADHD and ADHD is attention deficit hyperactivity uh, disorder. And this hyperactivity disorder makes the child very restless and he or she is very boisterous, aggressive uh, and uh, runs it all over the place, can't sit still, sometimes can be a bully. So, I mean, you have all this, then you have, you know, slow learners and differentiated abilities of learners and uh, dyscalculia, dysgraphia. So some of these learning, uh, I would say, you know, difficulties, can be evaluated at early childhood and then you have to have intervention strategies implemented in the school. Mirror neurons. And they showed how mirror neurons could be seen in the brain. And uh, you know, a monkey was given a banana and the other monkey also got a banana. A scientist showed that when they both peeled off the banana and they ate it, uh, brains in a certain, uh, you know, I mean the neurons in a certain area of the brains actually fired simultaneously. That means both the monkeys who were eating the banana were actually showing brain activity because they were both eating the banana. But uh, in the second phase of the experiment, only one monkey got one banana. The other was only observing. He or she didn't have the banana, that monkey didn't. And what happened is once the first monkey started eating the banana, the second one who didn't get it, who didn't get the banana to eat, actually started behaving or the brain started uh, firing the neurons in that certain area of the brain as though he or the monkey was actually eating of the banana. So it is showing a mirror neuron connection, almost like we can emulate in our mind, literally, scientifically, through neurons, what the other person is doing. So the response is similar for actually performing the action by just witnessing the action and just hearing about the action. You actually feel that you're actually doing whatever you're seeing or hearing or listening to. And mirror neurons actually enable empathy, skill building, and vicarious experiences. And there's some study to show that if uh, mirror neurons are silent, then you have autism. I mean, 
it's not clearly defined, but there is some study to show that. Um, and uh, we look at it was uh, the the discovery of mirror neurons was in the University of Parma by Giacomo Rizzolotti, scientist who was studying brain activity in the macaw monkeys. We saw these uh, neurons firing, you know, premotor cortex F5, and individual neurons respond to only very specific action. And it was, you know, published in experimental brain research and in brain journal. A paper was titled Mirror Neurons. Very important uh, to study the implications of mirror neurons, even in education, language, theory of mind, you know, theory of knowledge, socializing, how are social cues developed, how do people imitate each other, and how do people understand each other's actions. Infants, for example, are quick to look at their parents and emulate what the parents are doing. So you have to be good role models as teachers because people are observing you and they want to learn from you, whatever, good or bad, it doesn't matter. As long as you know what you're doing and you know you understand that what you're doing has more meaning than what they think, it's okay. Autism, special educational needs again, gender differences, and understanding people's intentions and goals and planning. So empathy neurons, okay, Dalai Brahma, they, they actually give the credence and credibility to him, but I think they're more than just that. Uh, I think it's scientifically reasoned to show that mirror neurons actually have a, a very scientific role to play in the minds of, and hearts of people. And uh, certain music therapy is very useful and therapeutic to calm children down. Those who have certain disorders and disabilities, you know, music therapy is to play a profound role in uh, calming people down. And classical music was shown to improve cognitive development and math learning ability and all kinds of combination of subjects being taught in the classroom. It's research by Daniel Levitin can show you this. Neurogenesis and neuroflexibility to show that you know new neurons can be secreted or produced in the human brain at every single age or stage of life. However old you are, it doesn't matter. You can still develop new neurons. So that's neuroflexibility and neuroplasticity of the brain. So it's an important concept in neuroscience to show that you can learn new things, and lifelong learning is actually scientific. If you look at the ninth very critical area on circadian rhythms and genetics and its implications on health and wellness in schools and in children, in adults and in universities. How do we do this research and how do we apply this through labs and through patents and you know make sure it is application based just for better quality of lifestyle so we can op optimize our own you know body clock and our own DNA can we really um, customize learning to our own needs uh, with genetic modulation? I don't know. It is a futuristic paradigm and uh, it could be very well possible whether it's ethical or not. So what is personalized genomics? You need to look at that. And the Human Genome Project, it was conducted very well. And uh, basically what they found is that, he, and they expatiated that the human genome actually underlies the fundamental unity of all members of the human family as well as recognition of inherent dignity and diversity of human beings. In a symbolic sense, it is the heritage of humanity. We are all formed of DNA, isn't it? Deoxyribonucleic acid and ATGC, purines and pyrimidines and the base pairs and the, and the you know, the, the backbones and all these symbols. And you can actually crack down life's code and you get all the answers. The molecular genetics of circadian rhythms was studied at a molecular level and the molecular genetics of the body clock was shown by Joseph Akahashi, uh, Department of Neuroscience and you know he did some uh, research studies over there in the US and he actually showed how intrinsic 24 hour rhythms arise from molecular interaction of key clock genes within the human body he carried out studies and this was even shown uh, to link diseases, if there are genetic issues at molecular level, then it actually causes some sort of diseases. And uh, genetics of the Drosophila was studied, which is the fruit fly, and mice also. And they studied the genome homology and they studied how these clock genes can actually, uh, you know, affect our lifestyle. Now circadian rhythm and health, circadian rhythms and health, yes, there are some problems when you have desynchronization of the body clock, you have issues like jet lag, shift work where people work at night and sleep during the daytime you know all kinds of, of fields and vocations and professions actually call for shift work 
Jet lag when you travel from east to west or west to east, there's a shift in the time zone, insomnia, sleeplessness, chrono medicine for you know, different very chronic disorders and ailments. So modern lifestyle due to air, light pollution, due to excessive use of gadgets and you know, high food availability and low physical exercise, stress, jet lag, shift work, you know, all this um, stress in terms of psychological stress or emotional stress or any unenriched environment, which is distressing you, lack of resources, for example, or a bad diet, uh, stuff like that can actually give you all kinds of problems. And the circadian syndrome has been seen to, the clock keeps time to monitor some of these things, you know. And uh, you can see the excellent studies done by Dr. Sachin Panda, of the Salk Institute, the United States and you know he's a professor there and uh, he's on the board of the you know you know areas of circadian rhythm studies and uh, in the University of California in San Diego and he's uh, an authority in uh, circadian medicine, medicine how the body clock is uh, useful to regulate health and also determine disease formations I mean that's how it is extrinsic factors and ex intrinsic factors uh, aging mutations and shift work chronic jet lag so some of these issues give rise to neurological and psychological diseases like depression, poor sleep quality, Alzheimer's diseases, and the metabolic and cardiovascular diseases could be diabetes, uh, metabolic uh, syndrome, hypertension, cardiovascular diseases. And so the body clock is actually uh, responsible for causing this as an output mechanism in case the input or there's a desynchronization of your lifestyle because of whatever, external stimuli, because of stress, because of you know homeostasis being inhibited or if there's a desynchrony of the body clock, if the timing of your body is not adequate, if your discipline is not adequate, if blood is not uh, healthy. So it is important to understand that circadian medicine uh, is here to stay and uh, we need to understand the effect of chronobiology in regulating these diseases, in chronotherapy, chronomedicine, all this is coming through now. And you can study this in detail, uh, how you know even lack of sleep and causes different kinds of issues and lack of you know, whatever in the extrinsic uh, synchronization variable of society of, of ziet givers and social cues and what, what happens, what really happens, sleep deprivation, what happens? And um, can we actually control cancer? Yes, probably by, you know, modulating the treatment of it uh, through optimizing drug dosages, at, uh, optimal levels at certain points of time in the day. And uh, there's learning and memory. Like I said, biocognitive cycles can be modulated. The cell cycle can be modulated, possibly in the future, even personalized genomics and uh, circadian systems. And sleep, can it be regulated? Yes. But remember, sleep is progressive only when it is through natural hormone, melatonin. You don't take a sleeping pill which puts you to sleep. Uh, that is a sedative. That is not a normal uh, sort of a mechanism to put you to sleep. What about, what about sex life? It's very important. Sex life is also important. And this determines, gives you that uh, normalcy and keeps you in a state of happiness and satisfaction. You need to see some of these things. And the cell cycle in your body, and uh, metabolism is very essential. And heartbeat, heart rate, of course, it varies during different stages and ages. And we have to control your circadian clock and, uh, in order to get all this um, mediated and uh, to be healthy and happy. That is wellness. Now, the last, not least, the most important, I would say, is the integrated science of holistic development. What is integrated science? You look at everything in combinations, parts and holes, and you know. So we look at um, holistic development, overall well-being, which is cognitive well-being, aesthetic well-being, physical well-being, social emotional well-being, and spiritual well-being, through the learning cycles and the theories the psychologists have postulated over the years. So many of these excellent uh, you know, Alfred Binet, Jean Piaget, Lev Vygotsky, Benjamin Bloom, Howard Gardner, Kurt Hahn, Daniel Goldman, John Dewey, Abraham Maslow. And, uh, you know, of course, I had talked to you about Howard Gardner. So all these theories are very useful for you to develop yourself holistically as a person, as a lifelong learner, and so that you can unlock your dimensions, all facets of your personality as a student, as an adult, as a lifelong learner. And if you look at the hierarchy of human intelligences, you have physical intelligence or physical quotient, body awareness and skillful use. And then uh, next on the period is your IQ. 
your intelligence quotient with math and verbal reasoning skills through languages and uh, mathematical symbolic sort of uh, combinations. And then the emotional intelligence, the emotional quotient, which is to manage yourself and relationships around you. And right on top of the pyramid is your spiritual intelligence, acting with inner wisdom guided by compassion, self-actualization, your ability to transform others, your ability to interact with the spirit realm, spirituality. So consciousness, very, very interesting. And then you look at the higher order thinking skills, whether these are critical thinking skills or reflective thinking skills, uh, or whether it's creative thinking skills or dialectic thinking. Of course, you have to study cognitions, different domain areas, subject areas, and yourself. Study yourself. So this is how we develop higher order thinking skills. Some acknowledgements. I want to thank some of the neuroscientists, Dr. Kathleen Sircone, Dr. Eric Jensen, Martha Caulfield in California, and uh, the chronobiologists, of course, Ronald Konopka, Selma Benzor, uh, Van Tsuitu, Uli Shibler, Joseph Takashi, Timothy Brown, Vinod Kumar, and Sachin Panda. Some of these very great research scientists in chronobiology have. Um, you know, unravel the mysteries of the circadian clock and circadian timing and how the neuroscience of learning is modulated, how the body clock and health are associated. What about dissociated and desynchronized circadian rhythms and the effects on your health and well-being? So I think it's a new science and uh, we can learn and study more as we do more research and see how it affects the neuroscience of learning and your health and your wellness. And uh, thank you very much. I wish you all the very best.